Hello and welcome to chapter five. This is our almost last chapter, very short in addition to it, chapter six of three sections, but almost there. We're going to start integrating this new thing called integration. So here's the outline of the chapter, starting with the one that we're going to be going over right now, and that is approximating areas. So we introduced in the previous section, that segue section, as I like to call it, in 4.10, where we learned how to undo the derivative called the antiderivative. Well, we first started with learning what the derivative was, that whole limit process, and then basically just taking the two points of our slope and making it become one. We then called it a derivative and knew what it found for us. Chapter three, we then learned all the different ways to take the derivative or differentiate. And once we exhausted all of those efforts, we then learned in chapter four how to apply the derivative in a few different ways. The last section of that chapter, 410, as mentioned before, was how to undo that. And now in chapter five, we're going to see what the antiderivative finds for us. And remember, the symbol we gave it was called an integral. So the process of doing the antiderivative is called integration. 5.1 approximating areas. So in the notes here, again, this is for your book. Hopefully you read through it. I'm just going to give you the highlighted points, the things that I wanted to emphasize and left blank so that we can write these things in and hopefully remember them a little bit more than anything else possibly, or at least better. So as mentioned a second ago, we're talking about antiderivatives or the integral and the symbol we gave that antiderivative which was an elongated S called an integral. I know, a lot of tough vocabulary words that are going to test us here. So that elongated S we call the integral is what we call the antiderivative. And if you couldn't guess what it's actually going to be finding for us, unlike the derivative, which was the slope of the tangent at a point, or what we called in the real world the instantaneous rate of change or velocity, now we're going to be dealing with areas. That's what the antiderivative is going to find for us. In a few ways that we will talk about what it looks like is using this other symbol for S from the Greek alphabet, capital S is called sigma. In the way that we're going to be doing, just like we did with derivatives for these antiderivatives or integrals, this thing we call a process of integrating, we will be having to use limits again. Because what we are going to do is take a bunch of little pieces and add them, sum them all up. And those pieces we decided were going to be rectangles. Why, you might ask? Well, those are just the easiest symbol other than that of a square. But it's not always easy to make the width and the length the exact same measurement. So what we are going to do is create the next best thing the cousin to the square, which is called a rectangle, All right? So our first definition here in 5.1 is going to be taking the sum, that's what this sigma capital S represents, of all of these elements or numbers, and we're going to do it starting from the bottom and working our way to the top. So from the number M to the number N. So what would that look like? Something to that effect to where we're going to start with plugging in that first thing, whatever M is. And so it'll be A sub N. We say sub down below just for naming purposes. And then we would go to the next thing, which would be one more than that. And then one more than that, all the way until we got to the very top. That's what we're trying to do in life, right? Work our way to the top here so that we can do all the way from M to N, all of those terms. Something that you should have seen before in previous courses. But of course, what we are going to do is take these things and add them all up to find that sum. But with calculus, we're going to push it to the limit. And we're going to try to make more of these so that we can get even closer to the actual answer of what this section is titled, approximating areas. Because the more rectangles that we can have to add up, then the better our approximation will be. So let's start off with a few more definitions. 5, 1, 
2 and 5, 1, 3, which is a theorem, which means it has been proven. And what we're going to say in a few of these is if we were to take up the sum from 1 to n, n things in other words, and we had just a constant, then we would have that constant n times. So rather than having to actually plug in the 1 and then the 2 and then the 3 and the 4 and the 5, all the way until our nth term, we know that because there's no variable here, there's no variation, it's always going to be that number, and we will have this many of them. Similarly, if we had some term multiplied by that constant, then we can just take that constant out in front of it and find the sum of that. If we were adding or subtracting multiple sums, then we can just find the sum of each individually and do that adding or subtracting, whichever is there. And we could even cut this up. If we didn't want to go from 1 to n, or there was a reason for us to split it somewhere, call it m, then what we could do is actually take the sum from the beginning. We're calling 1. We're just labeling it i for all of these terms. And if we started from 1 and had to go all the way to n, what if we went to m? Well, as long as we started on this one at the next thing, which would be m plus 1, the next one, and we go all the way to n, then we will have gone from 1 to n just by separating them. And notice there's a plus and a minus there because there are some times where we will get negative values that we will want to combat it. Right? So those are some of the things that we will see and utilize. But of course, we want more concrete answers. We don't want just find the sum, but take the constant out. Find each individually and then add or subtract. We want a scenario that works where if I was to find the sum of not just some, any constant, let's just say one, then again, based on this up here, I would have those in things, which happens to be a one that many times. So my answer would just be in. Where if I had some number, then we can actually say that, and this has been proven, that's why it's a theorem, that you could just take the number of things, multiply it by the next n plus one, and then divide that all by two or cut it in half. And that will always give you your sum of those one, two, three, four, five in things. Pretty cool. If you don't believe me, go ahead and try it. Just pick a number, any number. Say it was seven and add them up. One plus two plus three, all the way to seven. Get your answer and then try it by plugging this in, which would be seven times 7 plus 1, which is 8, so 56, and we would divide that by 2. And we know half of 56, hopefully, is 28. Add them all up, and you should also get 28. That also works when you have your thing squared. You got 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared. Again, all the way up to some number, say 7. Then this, or if it's cubed, then this would be the shortcut to not having to find each and every one of those things, starting at one and going to the n, whatever it might be, any number, you can merely just put these things in there. And we won't utilize this very much in this course, but this is for calculus down the road, which we're getting very close to the end here. Last few sections, chapter five and three sections in chapter six. All right, so that is what we're going to leave it with. If you ever see something like this, that that or that. Hopefully you will remember that you actually have a shortcut to getting there and go look it up and then use it so that you don't have to find each and every one of those, especially if it was one to a hundred. No, thank you. So let's get to the bigger picture of what we actually stated and started discussing at the very beginning of this course to introduce what calculus was. We had a couple of things, one called the area problem and the other, the tangent problem. I don't know if you guys remember that. Long time ago, I know. We've done a lot and learned a lot since then. And since we already talked about the tangent problem in depth with all of our derivative stuff, now we're going to focus in this last chapter and a half, the area problem. And since the derivative was the slope or instantaneous rate our tangent, we called it, then you can probably guess what 
is going to help us find the area. That's right, anti-differentiation in the integral. So here's a quick graph so that you can actually see what we're talking about here. And let's say we had some curve, let's call it f of x, from one point to another, we'll call those a and b. And as you can probably guess, continuous on this closed interval, all of that stuff that we've been talking about a lot that last chapter definitely helps us to ensure that this is going to, no pun intended, run smoothly. So once we have that, what we are then going to look for is what we call the area under it. Now under that curve to our x-axis. So from A up to our y value and B up to our y value. Now the problem is, how are we gonna find the area of this? You can probably guess that you can close this off and have your base down here. But even if I connected the top up here, we got some excess that we don't want. Yeah, there's issues when it's curved like this. And that's where we are going to discover that just by taking the antiderivative of this function, integrating, we call it, it will give us all of this area from A to B. We're not quite there yet. This is just the introduction to this process. What we're going to start by doing is picking from A to B how many little rectangles that we can split this into, and then we will go up and find the heights of each and every one of these rectangles. And then, remember the name of this was approximate. And we'll talk about whether we're going to do that from the right or the left, because if I go up here and go over, that's going to be different than if I went up here and over. And of course, we don't want to just approximate. We want to find as close as we possibly can what the actual area under this is. And for that, we will have to utilize the limit that we first introduced in chapter two and got you moving with calculus. So again, more notes. I hope you read through this stuff. I'm just not going to sit here and read it to you. If you're not in my class and you just found me on the web, go ahead and pause it and take a gander of what I'm trying to get the point across. But otherwise, what we're going to be trying to do is figure out what the best way to go about this is. How do we figure out how many rectangles would be best? How wide do we make each one? What about the length, that height? What we definitely do know is that the Remember that little lowercase d, delta, we called it. The difference in our x's, if we go back to the graph, the difference in our x's is just going to be, we'll take the bigger one minus the smaller one, so it's always positive. And that would be the difference in our x's. But what we want to figure out is how many cuts to make. So how many times are we going to divide this? Well, then that's what we're going to say in represents the number of rectangles that we will use. So the fellow that came up with this idea was a German mathematician by the name of Bernard Riemann. And what he discovered was that if we just called the width, what we already know, that delta x, if we can divide it any number of ways. Now, again, how many? What would be the best, the most possible? Because the more cuts we make, the less gaps or excess that we will have. And once we have those widths of the rectangle, then we would also need their heights. And how do we always find the height with any given function? We take an x and plug it into our function to find it. So that's why we're going to put a subscript right now of i. And hopefully you can see that this formula that Riemann came up with is not that impressive, to be quite honest. What is impressive is that he did it in the 19th century. Okay, that's why he gets the name and we get to use this, what is called Riemann sum. So we're just still finding the sum, but now of a bunch of little rectangles. And remember the area of a rectangle is just the length times the width. And the width we said would be, by our choosing, we're going to call it delta x. And that height, that length, we said, would be depending on where you're at, that x value, you could plug it in to find your y. So again, take a look at this. If I chose this x, that would be my height. If I chose this x, different height, different height, different height. But notice we can fix the widths to all be the same. 
and we get to decide how many of those we make. And as we mentioned, the more cuts, the better, because then the least amount of excess or gaps we would have. So our approximate would be even closer to the reality of that area under the curve that we're trying to find. So there are several different types that we will talk about and make sure that we get the process down. We'll do it for, uh, let's just say this one section. And then from there, we're going to want to find a better way. Sorry, Rimon. Good idea, but we want to find a better way. So let's start with what is called a left Riemann sum. And let's just use four rectangles. So let me show you what I mean here. Let's say we had just a parabola looking curve. All right, that's obviously been shifted up some. And if I wanted to take from any point, let's just say zero or whatever, and I want to go to any other, let's call it in general, A to B, and I wanted to make four rectangles, and we wanted to start on the left side of each one of those distances. Well, remember, we're going to take the width of each one of those, which would be the whole width divided by the number of rectangles we wanted. So in this case, it would be, let's say we started at zero and went to two, and we wanted four rectangles, then this would be two minus zero. That would be the whole width, but we wanted to divide it into four pieces. So each one of those widths will be a length of a half. So we would go over half, 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 and half. And then what we would have to do on each one of those endpoints Notice there's only four, even though it looks like there's five. We're going to start on the left side of that width. And then we're going to go over and down to create our rectangle. Then how are we going to get the next one? Take that width and go from the left side up and over. Take that width up and over. That width from the left up and over. And what could we then do from there to there? We could find the area of all four of my rectangles, which unfortunately you see is going to be a little less than what we should have. We're missing some values, but that would give us our approximate area under the curve. We are calling an L4 approximation, a Riemann sum from the left with four rectangles. What would have been even better? About 10 rectangles, 100. Yeah, but do we want to do that? <laughs> no, not really. Let's see what it would look like from the right. So now I still have that same width on each one of these, but now I'm going to start from the right end point rather than the left end point. And of course, I'm going to go up until I find my Y value. And then from there, I will go over and down. And then for that width, since I started on the right, I'll go to the next width and start on the right there until I hit my graph, my function. And then I'll go over and down. And then from there, the right, over and down. And from there, over and down. And now I got, well, unfortunately, a little bit more than what I wanted. But still a good approximation, even with just four rectangles. So what do you think might be even better instead of doing a left or a right? Hopefully you guessed right in the middle. The problem with right in the middle is, if you remember my zero to two, we said, just making up our endpoints, then the width of each one of these would be the two minus the zero over the four rectangles that we are making, or the width of each one of my rectangles would be a width of a half. Well, then what does that mean you would have to do to plug these in? Well, on the left, we would plug in zero and get our value. Then we plug in a half and get our value. And then we plug in one and get our value. And then another half, which would be one and a half or three halves. And that would give us our four heights needed for our four widths to find the four areas and get our approximation. Doing the same thing on the right, still going to all be one half, but to find the heights, here we would have started at two, then we would have subtracted a half of that, and then here we would have been at three halves, and then we would have been at one, and then subtracting a half each time, that's pretty easy. But what would we have to do if we did a midpoint from the left or the right? Now we're at, 
well, if this was zero and this was a half distance, then half of that would be a fourth. That's where this would be. And then we'd have to add a half to that to get this, add a half to that to get this. Or we could have gone backwards and went right to left. Either way, not as easy. So what we typically like to use are left or right endpoints for these Riemann sums. But to get a better approximation, notice if I did mark the halfway point and do my height, that looks pretty solid there. All of my area looks like I'm capturing. Here, also not bad. Here, you start to see a little bit of a gap and a little bit too much. And then this one, same thing. A little bit of a gap, but a little. It looks almost like the excess fills the void. And that's why we really like midpoint the best, but it's not the easiest to make as a uniform process that we want to be able to try to streamline and do as quickly as possible without having to do the visuals and just do it algebraically. So remember, these are called Riemann sums, and they are only approximations. And we will write for the left, however many rectangles, whatever number, L sub N from the right, R sub N, and every once in a while, if we wanted to, we could do M sub N. Not used as much, mainly the L and the R. The problem with all of that is we do all of that work using four, eight, 20 rectangles, and it still only gives us an approximation. We want to make it exact. We want to know exactly how much area is under that curve from two endpoints. Any idea how we might do that? Did you say just cut it more or make even more cuts? Could we just keep doing this indefinitely? Well, what does that kind of sound like that you're doing? If you just keep making more and more and more cuts, sounds like you might be approaching something. Maybe I gave you a little too much there, but should have come up with a limit. That's right. We're going to reintroduce the limit yet again in this chapter, just like we did with L'Hopital last chapter. Because with a limit process, it allows us to approach that value by sending things towards some goal. So here's what that would look like for us in a very important definition, the fifth one of this section, which again needs to have a continuous function on a closed interval where that Riemann sum that we classified as this, where this represented our length times this represented the width of those rectangles, all starting with, say, the first all the way up to the nth, however many we decided, then we know that the area under the curve over that interval can be found exactly if we were to make our rectangles go to infinity. What if we cut it so many times that you couldn't even see the cuts? Well, then that's going to give you the whole story, all of the area. And that's what we're headed towards taking those lengths, times, widths, areas of all of those little rectangles, and now finding what it's approaching as we make an infinite number of cuts. And you may be wondering, how in the heck are we going to find all of those areas, add them together to get a total, if we're going to do it infinitely? By throwing the limit and using calculus, we're going to change all of the Greek the old stuff for our old way of finding area. And we're just going to rewrite it in our newer way using calculus and this thing called the antiderivative or integral. And notice our delta also changed to the new letter D of our alphabet rather than the Greeks. Okay, so I just wanted to wrap up this section by giving you a little bit of inspiration, hopefully not humiliation. There was a third grader, about eight years young, named Gauss. He was a genius, kid prodigy, so don't feel too bad. And what his teacher gave him and his peers was the task of adding up all the numbers from one to 100. And before he could go and sit down at his desk, the teacher 
as he started to kick up his feet and probably open up the newspaper thinking he bought himself some time, little Freddie Gauss handed him the answer and said, what else you got for me? No, I added that last part. I'm not sure about all that. But he did, at this age, come up with that. Pretty extraordinary. And what he discovered were just patterns. And he figured out, well, you know what? I'm not going to just sit here and do this mundane task. I'm going to just look at what he wanted where the rest of his peers probably just went off to the races. And again, this is before calculators and started doing one plus two is three, three plus three is six, the six plus four is, and so on. It would have taken them forever. But what he noticed was, you know what? What if I just started at the ends and I added those up together? Well, that gives you 101. And if I took the next two values, that also gave me 101. And the next, and the next, And the next, and since he was pairing up the numbers one through 100, he knew that he would have 101 50 times. So even doing 50 times 101 is pretty impressive at that age. But that's what he was able to discover. And if you notice some of the things that we talked about earlier, if we were to rewrite this in our terms for our discussion today, we would have had our first indice starting at one and going all the way up to 100. And that would just be of the number, the value. And if you go back to our definition, or in this case, it was a theorem, 5.13 part B, this is exactly what he discovered. And it says that you can just take N, N plus one divided by two. And if we took the N, which is a hundred things, and we got 101 and divided it by two, since these are multiplying, We can actually cancel the two into the hundred and you get 50, 101 times. So I just wanted to do one quick example of one of these just to get you started. So I'm going to skip down to number three and we're going to find, again, notice the approximate area under the curve of this from zero to two, just like I had mentioned earlier as an example. And if we wanted to find four things from the left, then we know that those rectangles that we're going to be finding, of which there would be four of them, we are going to go from A to B, meaning our delta X would be the 2 minus 0 over the N, which we said would be four things. So the width of every single one of these would just be one half. And since I know what the length times width the area of a rectangle is, Because it's going to be one half for every single one of these, one little shortcut that we know is we can just take this whole set of values and just factor out that one half, which means all we really need to know is what side we're going to choose. So for this one, F of, we're starting at zero, and then we're going to do F of one half, one, three halves. And as long as we can find those lengths, those heights of each one of those things, rather than multiplying each one of those by a half, we will just add those heights up and then multiply by half one time instead of every single time. Now, remember, they told us how to find our y values as long as we know our x. We'll square it and add three. And if you did that to each one of these, you would get... And if we take all of those values and add them up, when you squared the zero plus three, squared the one half plus three, one plus three, three halves squared plus three, you will get, keeping them all as fractions, 58 fourths, which we will then multiply all of those heights added together by the width of each. And half of 58 divided by four yields 29 fourths. So that is our approximation, our Riemann sum from the left using four rectangles of this function from zero to two. I'll leave R4 and M4 for you guys to work out in the rest of our examples. Hopefully this makes a little bit of sense going forward. We're going to stop doing this arduous task and start streamlining it using integration and integrals. Keep working hard, everyone. I'll see you soon for 5.2.